Thank you for tuning in to the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast. Please subscribe to our weekly Boston Bruins Hockey Talk on listening platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher Radio, and Spotify Podcasts. We'd certainly appreciate it if you give us show a five-star rating along with a written review. You can also subscribe to our official YouTube channel for a video version of our weekly program. If you'd like to support our show financially, please go to our blackandgoldhockey.com website and click on our affiliated Fanatics banner before shopping online. Another way to financially support our weekly program is to become a Patreon member to be eligible for weekly Boston hockey prizes and monthly Boston Bruins and signed jersey giveaways. Please go to patreon.com slash black and gold hockey podcast and donate just one dollar per episode. Many thanks for the continued support and enjoy the show. What's up, Bruins fans? Welcome back to the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast. This is a bonus pod, episode 290, and uh, we have a lot of news that dropped today. So the bonus pod, we're going to talk about the recent signings, which there were a lot of them, and we also have a very awesome interview that we did with 2022 Boston Bruins draft pick, Matthew Poitras. Poitra. Poitra. I can't believe I messed that up. I Watch didn't it. even do it once with him on there. But anyway, we have uh, Matthew, and he's from the Guelph Storm, and he was he was kind enough to join us from up in Canada, up in the Ontario area, where he's currently training, getting ready for the Prospects Challenge and the upcoming training camp and the OHL season, obviously. But we were really excited to have him on, and many thanks to Dom and the, uh, the Guelph Storm organization for making everything come together. It was awesome, and we truly appreciate that. But... Um, we do have some Bruins news as well. It was a very interesting day. Started off in the morning with with Patrice Bergeron, a video walking through uh, the the corridor at probably Warrior Ice Arena, walking onto the ice, gives the, everybody a wink, and that's it. And what does that mean? Later on, it meant that he signed a one year deal worth two point five million and another. Two point five million in bonus incentives. How are we feeling about Saint Patrice, the captain, returning to our Boston Bruins team? You know what I love about it. I love, and we can say this about David Krejci as well. I love that the Bruins, through their social media, trolled Bruins fans with that because. Um, some of the stuff that was being thrown up. Look, everybody in the hockey world knew this was going to happen. It was just a matter of time, and everything had to fall into place. And they basically just trolled those Bruins fans that were um, calling for Cam Neely's head on a silver platter, calling for Don Sweeney's head on a silver platter, calling for Jeremy Jacobs' head on a silver platter. Uh, kudos for them. Uh, or to them for doing it the way they did. I'm happy they did that. Kevin, your thoughts on the Patrice Bergeron signing? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm really excited, and kind of like Dom was saying, I'm really happy to see you know that happen because that's something they typically don't do. You don't typically see Boston Bruins social media accounts kind of having fun, and that's what we got to see today. But I mean, we all three of us on this panel have known. 
um, that this was going to happen. It's For just months. when was it going to happen? <laughs> you know, it, it's it, I've been sitting back, enjoying the pool, enjoying my summer. No worries because we all knew what was going to happen. Now, I actually mentioned um, on one of the previous podcasts, I wonder if what might be taking, maybe not what's taking so long, but I wonder if they're going to try to do a little bit bigger of a cap hit so there's less bonus incentive money going on to next year's cap. And that's something I was wondering, and it looks like they evened it out pretty well with this contract. Um, so I, I'm I'm really excited. I mean, our captain's back, baby. Let's go. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, the second one was was exciting as well. Uh, a picture of David Krejci with a little bit of a smile, and then minutes later, what seemed to be minutes later, the Boston Bruins released an official statement saying that David Krejci is back with the team signs a one-year deal worth one one million dollars but his uh he has a signing bonus incentives of two million so another cap friendly deal uh, performance bonus not signing bonus sorry perform performance bonus um my bad <laughs> well dom almost whacked you right there i know jesus yeah, i felt no. the pressure i got the meat sweats going on now <laughs> 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 but no i mean at first, i mean uh Krejci, let's let's just face facts. We have known this for a long time, but we've also known that David Krejci to the Boston Bruins and in their current cap situation, not today, but a, you know a couple of weeks ago, that he was legitimately legitimately the best free agent forward the Bruins could get. Now, I'm not saying talent wise or anything like that, but it's it was something the Bruins needed to do to work in when you talk about money. So this was a great deal for them to get him back in the fold, getting some people back together. We might rejuvenate a guy like Patrice Bergeron, who also signed, and looking forward to working with the younger crew and so on. Um, but I thought it was a it was a good signing, and and you know, hey, guess what? We have a two second line center now. Hey, you know what? Their number one and number two centers this year are counting as three point five million dollars towards the cap. The Toronto, Maple, Toronto Maple Leafs, for example, are six times that much. It's maddening. So, but, and we probably with the same chance to win the cup too. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's interest. It's what's going to be interesting because, I, you know, if they're going to want to carry seven defensemen, so um, that means either. Jack Cashon or Connor Carrick are are going to be on the opening night roster. Um, they can clear a roster spot simply by putting two of McAvoy, Grizzlick, or Mar Marshan on injured reserve. And the reason I say two is because there's questions about whether they're willing to try and put uh, Jack Stanika through the waiver wire. So at, at least by doing that, um, you, putting two of the three on injured reserve, they really don't have to worry about it. But they are $2.6 million over the cap once they send Chris Wagner down. Now, you could long-term injury reserve uh, Charlie McAvoy, and they're fine. You don't have to LTIR all three of them. Uh, just McAvoy's salary alone is enough is enough to cover. What they do after everybody's healthy is the big question mark. And I think, and I know Kevin has mentioned this many a times before in previous podcasts, that Craig Smith might be the one to exit because his three point one million dollar cap hit more than covers it and would allow them to bank cap space for trade deadline. Yeah. And obviously, a player <coughs> like uh, Craig Smith is the most attractive thing right now when you're trying to cut that yeah. salary space because nobody's really looking for an aging veteran like Nick Foligno. So right. it, that makes total sense. You, get, you still get um, Craig Smith, who is in, in his younger 30s. He is an aging veteran. I get it. But you also has a little bit more value than a guy like Nick Foligno. So, yeah, that makes total sense in my opinion. Yeah, and, and you you know you've got again. I know Kevin's a big fan of Oscar Steen, who could potentially play that third line. Um, you got another big fan, 
a guy Kevin's a fan of is Mark McLaughlin, who could fill that role. And then let's not count out Fabian Lysel. You know, so they got three entry level contracts that they can use on. Well, I guess Steve isn't really an entry level, but he's paid like one. Uh, that can fill two of those, two of those right wing spots. Yep. All right. So first, I do want to say welcome back, Karachi. I love the deal. I'm very happy about this. I, um, I, I didn't think this was possible until. And I brought it up to you guys immediately. I said, look at this video that David Pasenak just put out with David Krejci. I'm st- I said to you guys, I said, I don't think David Krejci would allow that to go out if this wasn't an actual possibility. And I told you guys I was at 50%. He, he's coming back 50%. He's not. And the further we got into it, I mean, dang. <laughs> it became yeah. reality. I remember this time last year we were all talking like, enough with the Krejci nonsense. He's done. He's not coming back. This and that. Don't hold on to this. Don't hold on to that. And here he is, proven. I mean, at least me wrong. I can't speak for you two, but well, well, we had the realistic theories going on with his his return, and it wasn't last year. A lot of Bruins Correct. fans were like, "Oh my God, he's ripping it up over in a league that's probably less than the AHL, maybe just a t, a small midget." less than the AHL, but we all knew that there was a December 12th, I think that was a deadline, whatever, that he had to sign by, or mm-hmm. whatever, you know, so or it the was waivers. Just, yeah, we all said that this is a more real, realistic move for him to come back to Boston during the off season and early, if, if that. I didn't expect it to be this bad, but I'm sure he's been in the area working out, doing the summer skates and so on, like they always do. I didn't expect him to ever come back, though, and that's the difference with me. I, even even this off season, I didn't expect it. I'm eating crow now, and that's fine. I'm fine to eat crow on that. But um, you know, going off of what Dom said, I mean, yeah, Craig Smith, uh, definitely a possibility to be moved. Um, but one player in particular that I wonder, um, you know, if they do end up putting a guy like Charlie McAvoy on um, L- uh, LTIR or you know whatever they may do. Um, I wonder if a guy like Mike Riley is the one who ends up going once Matt Grizzly is ready to go, and they maybe hold on to Smith just for the playoff run, um, as they are pretty heavy on that left side. I wonder that as well. Be, I, I think either one of the two could be the ones to go because both of them have very similar cap hits. I believe Craig Smith is at three point one, and Mike Riley is at three. Um, Craig Smith's deal ends at the end of this season while Riley's got another two years uh, or is another year. Uh, It might be another two years. I don't remember exactly. I think it's another year after this season. Two years after this season, one more. Correct, yeah. So that might be a little bit – you might be able to get maybe a better return for something like that, even though it's not going to be that great of a return because GMs know, well, you've got to drop somebody. Um, you know, to become cap compliant. So, but I think those two players are the ones you'd probably look at to move. One of those two players. I don't foresee well, it being any. Let me ask you this, Kevin. Uh, because there's a, a gluttony of defensemen. If if you're moving Smith, would you include Connor Clifton as a sweetener for somebody to to take him? Uh, only making a million dollars, uh, one year left, and put Zaboro on the right side. So that that depends for me because if Zaboro proves that he is better than a bottom pairing right shot defenseman, I don't want to have him there and have him be tied to that for this season. I I, I would rather him continue to reach whatever type of potential he could possibly have because I think I mean I think all three of us truly believe that he's going to have a top four role um, to start the season here, whether that's next to a guy like Brandon Carlo or next to a guy like Hampus Lindholm, um, I, um, or even a guy like Derek Fulbert um, while he plays the right side, or Riley. Um, I, I foresee them utilizing that right shot, that he, the right side that he can play. And, I mean, I, I would love to. I know Dom has said this in the past, too. I'd love to see him play with Hampus Lindholm on that top pairing. So if that happens and he's flourishing, I 
don't know if I want to see him drop down to a third pairing role. Um, I'd rather see him possibly once everyone is healthy again, get those top four minutes next to a guy like Brandon Carlo dropping Grizzlick down to the third pairing, um, you know, to play, but then you have Derek Forbort too. It, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I'm talking myself yeah. in, in circles here, but exactly. I mean, it, it's a good problem to have, but I mean, I'm not against it. Of course. I think, you know, a little bit of development for Zaboral this season, um, staying healthy is a big part of it. Um, maybe he can do that a lot better playing on the right side on a bottom pairing with a guy like Derek Fulbert. Um, so, you know, okay. So Mark, thing. Mark, let me ask you, because I, I know we talked uh, about it, I think two podcasts ago, um, where I said, I, I believe Jack Sean will be on the opening night roster because of the injuries and they need a power play quarterback without, uh, McAvoy and Grizzlip there. What if a Sean shows he can play at this level and uh, makes it difficult to send down? I know waivers comes into play and he doesn't require waivers, so he's likely the the, the first man down. But um, if that's the case, they'll have two, four, six left shot defensemen that are capable of playing in the in the NHL when everybody's healthy so what do you do i obviously you got to use him i mean his his um mobility along the blue line i've seen so much uh ashan plays a really good really good transition game and so on i think he'd be a valued asset on a power play whether number one or number two I do understand the fact that we do have to get a little bit bigger and so on on the defense. And that why that's why maybe Zabor will be a little more attractive. But Zabor doesn't move like Jack does. He doesn't have the quick feet like that. Zabor can be offensive and he can add that that type of the game. But I don't think at that level that Jack can. Just by the way his he's a little player. The guy could freaking move, you know and. I don't know. It's it's so like 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 uh, Kevin said. It's a good problem to have. So and it's really going to be a battle uh, in training camp for all these players that have these opportunities to secure spots or even um, you know the seventh or eighth pair uh, eighth role in a defense. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I see value in Nashan in the NH in the NHL and the American Hockey League. So I'm I'm pretty sure that's not how to answer the question appropriately, Dom, but. That's just my thought on how both players move opposed to their defensive uh, prowess. Kevin, do you have any thought on it? I mean, honestly, if Jack Ashan shows that he can play at the NHL level, um, quality minutes can, quarter, can quarterback a power play, once Grizz looks healthy, I'm moving him. Yeah, because the only defensemen that really have any value is McAvoy, you're not trading him. Lindholm, you're not trading him. Carlo, you're not trading him. And Grizzlick. And he may he may be the one you could move for pieces if Ashad shows he's capable of, of taking on that role. So I don't know. I, I think the options that they have are, they have numerous options, and I'm just curious to see which way they're going to go. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting on how all this pans out. Yeah, um, Grizzlick is a fantastic, you know, defenseman. He is. He, you know, he plays pretty well defensively. He also plays pretty well offensively. He's not the best at either of those, but he's dependable. Um, for a team looking to win a cup, I, I, I mean, he'd be fine as maybe a fourth guy, but I'd rather him as a fifth guy. Um, so if they can get good quality minutes out of whether it's Ashan or Zaboral or both, and they show that they can be top four guys who are young and capable, I mean, you got to move them. You got to move them. It'll create space for you at the deadline too to, you know, have more options available to you if you want to, you know, make a splash. If you feel like you're actually positioned to go for a good run, so 
I mean, okay, so let me ask both of you one more question of, of, about this, and then we'll move on. Um, if you're an opposing general manager, and I'm Don Sweeney, would you give me a second round pick for Matt Grizzlick if I was willing to retain one million dollars? And the reason I'm willing to retain one million dollars, one, it fixes my cap situation, but two, increases the value of, of Matty Grizzlick and opens him up available to to more teams because of the lower cap hit. He's currently making what, three point seven five? 3.687. 3.687. I mean, I don't know about you, Mark, but do you think he's worth that contract? I, I sure do. I think he's definitely that. I mean, for what he does uh, playing in a top four role for the Bruins, I think that's a steal of a contract for him as a type of player. That's just my opinion. Um, so if I was a GM. pick, though. Kevin. If yeah, I know. If I was a GM, I'd probably give a second round pick for that, just because the contract's so good and he can play in your top four. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm, I, I'm the same. I would just give uh, without without the salary retention. But I mean, if it takes the salary retention, um, yeah. If I was an opposing GM, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Um, yeah. I think that would be you know good for both sides too. I agree with that. Opens up a roster spot and a little bit of cash. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm totally on the fence with that idea. Um, you know, I like Grizzly and so on, but I also like the business side and how it how it works because you you still you have you have some good defensemen that are going to be down in Providence uh, that you can bring up if needed, uh, and I I kind of think that if we keep hanging on to Matt Grizzly, we're going to start bottlenecking uh, the the prospects that are, are shortly to come through. So that's just my opinion. It's probably no truth to it, but I'm just throwing it out there. And Dom, too, another thing, too, is we don't have a second-round pick for next year's draft. That second-round pick would be very, very valuable for that draft. Yeah. So The guy thinks 10 steps it. ahead of us, guy. All for it. Uh, all I'm, for it. I, I like to think two years ahead. What's, what's it going to look like two years from now? You know? Right, right. Um, like, I, I saw somebody make a trade uh, – uh, proposal and I forget what it was going to Anaheim something like Jake DeBrusque uh, Mike Riley uh, somebody else plus our second round pick in 2024 and I'm like are we trading our second round pick to Anaheim for the second time because we've already traded that pick so yeah <laughs> you know um, who was it for by the way Dom I need to know who it was for what do you mean who the trade was for? Because you said you said the package. It didn't say. It didn't say for what. Oh, oh, it didn't. It was just randomly just. That's yeah. Funny. Um. Ugh. All right, that's funny. All right. Um, um. To wrap up on the these topics, we do have to talk about the hat trick for hashtag Sweeneyus uh, today, and that was getting Pavel Zaka signed to a one year deal, three point five million. Um, and they uh done, and they don't have to go to arbitration on the eleventh. So, um, I one question I wanted to ask Dom while you were away on your break, um, with with Zaka signing before the arbitration, does this open up open up a buyout window? No. Yes, the buyout window is still open. But remember, uh, yeah, all they have to do is file to have the buyout window. <laughs> but you can't buy anybody out unless they're making. Over four point eight million dollars. It's not uh, like okay. the first buyout window. The second buyout window is different. Okay, I understand. And uh, thought thoughts on the Zaka um, signing for at least a year. Well, I wish it was a two year deal, but uh, you know, information I had heard was they were looking, <coughs> excuse me, at a two year deal, which would have paid them uh, three point five this year, four point five next year for an AAV of four million. Um, but you know, they have to get Pasternak done for next year. Um, I haven't crunched the numbers to see whether, where that would leave them in terms of tagging space. Um, so maybe that had an effect on it. All right. Yeah. And, um, also, I mean, when you look at that whole deal, um, 
I really wish that second year was on there too. And one of my reasons is because I think his value is about to increase in his first year with the Boston Bruins. I think he's going to have his best season yet as a pro. He's going to be, I think he's going to be starting off with some top six minutes, um, you know, with the with Bergeron being out. I think you will see him in the top six. Marshan. Marshan. Sorry, Marshan. I apologize. Yep. Okay. Um, but you think he'll be with Bergie and DeBrusque to start? I want to get to that. I want to get to that. I do. Um, when it comes to the lineup, because now that we have all three of them signed, it's a lot easier to talk about this. So assuming Craig Smith is still here and not traded or anything okay. like that, uh, let's just go with what we have. Um, I, I honestly, what I would do is I would keep Hall, um, Krejci, and um, Pasternak together. I'd, I'd keep that right off the rip because I want them to gain that chemistry. I, um, because we know Taylor Hall and David Krejci have it. So is that your number? Is that your number one line? Correct. When Marshan gets back, that's that my number good. one line, and then that's you do Zaka Bergeron DeBrusque. Okay. And my reasoning for that also is other than, you know, wanting, you know, because, like I said, Hall and, and uh, Krejci have it. Hall and Pasternak have it. But at the NHL level, Krejci and Pasternak don't really have it. So I want to see all three of them come together in a full training camp, preseason, and, you know, to get off and running to start the season. All of them together do not change it. Let them do their thing. Um, and then I think Bergeron and DeBrusque, They've developed some chemistry there playing on, you know, with him on the right. I do wonder if DeBrusque is going to be able to play the right side as well, not having Martian on the left. Um, you know, I don't know how Zach is going to play that side. I don't think it's going to be anything like Martian. So um, that'll be interesting to see. But I think that only taking out Zaka and putting in uh, Martian is going to be a lot better for the team as far as um, – you know, consistency wise for the players, like switching DeBrus back to the left and then switching them back over to the right. That might be interesting to see, but just dropping Zaka down and putting Martian in, that seems like a lot easier on the players. Uh, yeah. That's just my opinion. No, I agree with you there. So what's your third line then? You got Coyle Smith and you're going Frederick. Yeah, I, I am because again, I mean, they had some really good, um, they had some really good um, weeks. I'm going to say weeks. They had some really good weeks together um, last season. So I'd like to see them get a training camp in preseason as a line and see how they can do. Um, <clears throat> so that's where I'd be at. But if not, I'd be totally fine with doing Studnika in the middle, Coil on the right with um, – uh, sorry, no, you can't do that if Smith's still there. So, no, I guess you can't do that. You're looking at Stanika possibly so, taking no sex spot on the fourth line. When Marshan's healthy, uh, I I believe he's coming back sooner than than everyone expects. So mm -hmm. you've got Zaka, Coyle, and Smith as your third line. So you're dump, you're bumping Frederick down to your fourth line with no sick and steam. See, yeah, I, don't like that, I don't like that fourth line. Unless, smart. Uh, yeah, it's kind of I don't know. It's kind of sketchy for me too. But I'm not. It's I, I'm too far away from really putting the rosters together. To be honest with you, I gotta really think about this. We should do this as a, for an upcoming episode. Is if it like talk about our per, our perfect um, rosters? Uh, yeah, that's four. a good homework assignment. Yeah, we can do yeah. that. Um, cool. But we gotta we, we gotta remember Felino too. He's still yeah. on the roster. I mean, I think they're going to give him a chance for sure. I mean, he's he's making three point eight million dollars. He's a veteran, you know, with success in the league. I'm sure they're going to at least give him, you know, camp and preseason to really figure it out. But if he can't, if he can't figure it out, he's going to lose a spot this year. I really do. Well, think he's so. starting. On, he's starting on the fourth line, right? Yeah. yeah. You're not going to put him on the third line. And with with Marshan out and Zach going up, um, he's your fourth line left wing. Yeah, I'm talking more of oh, that's true. Yes, okay. So I guess I'm going more now. I'm going more into um, you know once everyone's healthy. 
you know, if Felino has proven himself, then Frederick now takes the back seat. Mm. See what happens. We'll see. All right. um, Do you guys have anything else to talk about? I think we covered Uh, it. No, I think we pretty much covered it. All right. Um, Well, except maybe Don Sweeney today probably won him uh, GM of the Year award. Exactly. (laughs) Where are the torches and pitchforks now? Yeah. But uh, no, anyway, uh, yeah, that is going to be the uh, the podcast for this week. Um, we're going to do our exit now. But we're going to bring in uh, the uh, Matthew Poitou, um, uh interview that we did a little earlier, and yeah, that was a fantastic interview. And we really appreciate Matt and the Gulf Storm for doing that. And Dom, thank you very much for your legwork, and uh, and uh, Kevin for coming in on a Monday after your bowling banquet or uh, whatever. <laughs> Bowling banquet. It's a tournament. It's a sport, Mark. <laughs> but I uh, know I appreciate you having being here and, and doing this, um, you know, updating the, the listeners on the news that we had today and also participating in the interview with Matthew because he was a, a fantastic, fantastic um, guy, guy to talk to. And I really look forward to, um, you know, watching his uh, upcoming season at Guelph. So with that being said, should we just like, like – Call it a day and, and uh, go right into the uh, Matthew Poitou interview. Yeah, yeah I, I do. I do pretty much covered. Yep. Yeah, I, I do want to say though that the uh, Motley Crew, Def Leppard, and uh, Joan Jett and Poison show was incredible. For any of you who uh, got to make it out there on Saturday night, I was there. How did you? What how did you show. make up? Did you like? How could you see with all the Aquanet in your eyes? All the what? <laughs> All the Aquanet, the hairspray. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, I saw it God. just fine. It was no, I'm just kidding. I'm, it kidding. Was a good, I'm it glad was you had a good weekend, bud. Oh, it was good. Inquiry minds want to know, what did you pick off the buffet table? <laughs> From where? The bowling tournament. There was no buffet table, Dom. Oh, there was a bar, though, and I did get mozzarella sticks and tater tots. Right. So you, <laughs> there was food. Come there on. was a bar yeah. there. And I and I did get that. So I mean, okay. you got to eat something, you know. All right, boys, let's let's wrap this up. I gotta I gotta edit and do all this stuff to get it out here as soon as possible. So we'll end it right now and bring in Matthew Poitois, the Boston Bruins 2022 second round draft pick. <laughs> All right, Bruins fans, as we mentioned earlier in the program, we do have a very special guest with us. It is Matthew Poitois, and he is from the Guelph Storm and the 2022 NHL draft pick of our Boston Bruins. Matt, thank you uh, for the time, and welcome to the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast. Yeah, no worries. Excited to get started here. Nice, nice. Uh, how's everything going so far with your summer, and uh, how's the family up there? Uh, we're good. Uh you know, uh, just spending a lot of time on the ice in the gym. A uh, bit of a, I'd say, a bit more busy summer uh, on on the ice than I'm usually used to. Um, used to kind of taking a bit of a month off, but with everything kind of going so fast, the draft and development camp kind of had to kind of cram and get on the ice as much as possible and take every opportunity I've had. So, yeah, it's going well. That's awesome. Yeah. And it can... Congratulations on the draft selection and so on. That's a, uh, it must be tremendous for you and your family to 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 get to that point where you're you you now know that you're going to be an NHL or sooner or later. Yeah, uh, you know the past year has been pretty stressful. Uh, kind of everything leading up to the draft was so kind of big weight off the shoulders. Get it over with, and you know I'm happy to be a Bruin. Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to start with uh, a first question from a, a, good, a passionate listener and, and a really good supporter, Tom, on Twitter. But he wants to know uh, when you started skating and actually playing hockey. And I want to I want to follow with that and say who inspired you. Like, was it a family member or somebody you watched on TV that got you really into hockey? Um, I think I started skating around the age of three, pretty young, uh, just you know, hockey's always kind of been in my family. Uh, my dad played hockey. My mom played hockey. So, And then I have an older brother. He also played hockey. So, you know, kind of being the younger brother role, I wanted to kind of do everything he was doing, looking up to him growing up. So kind of a no-brainer uh, for my parents. And I was excited, and they put me on the ice. And 
um, obviously lots of great things have happened since then and hockey is kind of like my big part of my life now it's led to a lot of friendships so I'm very glad that uh, my parents decided to do that so awesome when you guys your, your mom was uh, quite successful too she won a championship with um, uh, who was it now Matt remind me um, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, hopefully yeah, Ron doesn't listen. Talk about yeah. it too much, so oh, yeah. you might know more than me. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, she follows me on Twitter, so I'm going to oh. tell her that uh, <laughs> that you didn't know the answer. So oh, well, I, I don't know what championship she she won. I know she played a lot of hockey as long as she could and at a pretty high level, but I don't know what championship she would have won. Uh, I thought she had won one. I'm going to have to look that up now. Okay. Okay. So here's my thing. Like most fans always want to know what your favorite team growing up uh, was. And I'm not going to ask you. I'm just going to tell everybody it was the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, So I won't put you on on the spot there. Um, Obviously, your family had a big influence on you. But I want to talk to you about uh, this past season, like you had a great start to the season, the team had a great start to the season. Things leveled off just towards the end a little bit for you guys, and it, it it's a really really young team, so there's great things ahead for you. Do you think that the year off because of the pandemic affected not only you but some of your teammates that you know hadn't played hockey for over a year? Yeah, I think it definitely had an effect on our team. Probably had an effect on every team. All of us kind of, except for like a few players, all of us kind of had a full year off from hockey. And especially, I don't know, here in Ontario, I don't know how it is everywhere else, but we had no ice, like no gyms. We couldn't really do anything. So um, it definitely had a, I'd say it had an impact on development. Um, kind of missing a full year on the ice, obviously, isn't great. But, you know, we kind of just took things in stride. We had a good start. Um we were first. We were first place at Christmas. Like, yeah, you know the game super hot. Then, you know, during Christmas we all went home. Um, a lot of us ended up getting COVID. Uh, kind of coming back, uh, it was pretty hard. Just the, uh, you know, getting back to the pace. Um, just the, I don't know how it had effect on like some of my other teammates, but for me, I just felt kind of sluggish for a few weeks after I had it. But you know, we went on a bit of a cold slide there, and I think. Figured it out as the season got, went on. It's a long year, especially for all the, yeah. the 15 rookies we had. We're, no, none of us were used to playing a, a 68 game season with three and threes. So, um, it was, I don't know, it was a tough year, but a great, great learning experience, and hopefully it pays off next year, uh, knowing what to expect. So, I think it will for you guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're expecting to have a good team. So, yeah. Kevin. Yeah. So um, definitely a lot of adjustments were made going into a season you know, and having COVID kind of ruin it a little bit, but not much because you did have a great rookie season there. Um, so going into next season, what parts of your game are you looking to approve upon? For me this summer, I've just been working on putting on a bit of weight and just uh, improving my skating. Um, I've been doing, well, when I've been home, I've been doing uh, power skating twice a week. Um, I think it's paying off. When I, when I got to development camp, I felt really good on the ice, um, kind of, for me, the big thing was like the bash on my game was kind of speed coming through the neutral zone, and um, that's kind of something I've been working on, just being explosive and getting stronger. Um, some of it goes to the gym, and some of it's technical, but uh, it's something I've really been working on. I think it's improved quite a bit. Um, so kind of just getting faster and getting stronger, putting on a bit of weight, just, just so I can kind of compete with the bigger guys and move better through the neutral zone. So. Yeah, and that's something that I've heard you say in I, I, another interview I watched that you were in. You, you mentioned your explosiveness and how you want to work upon that. Um, now, wh- what exactly do you do with your game to kind of make up for the lack of that explosiveness while you're still continuing to work upon that skating? I think uh, I mostly kind of rely on my ability to play in tight areas. Um, for me personally, I may create a lot of offense uh, down low and in the offensive zone this year rather than more on the rush. And if I can kind of fine-tune being on the, uh, scoring on the rush, I think it'll lead to a lot more goals and points. Um, but, you know, I kind of try and rely on my smarts. Um, I think I'm a 
pretty uh, smart player when I have the puck, looking for the open open play. Um, sometimes not the obvious play. Uh, a little, I have a little risk to my game, but mostly, yeah. <laughs> I think all I the great ones do, Matt. Yeah, I do end up making the right play, but just for me, you know, uh, facilitating and uh, possessing the puck is just kind of the way I like to play, and that's how I make up for maybe not being the best skater. But, Matt. Matt, I apologize for jumping around on timelines here, but uh, going back to the 2022 NHL Combine, uh, what did you take away from your first meeting with the Boston Bruins organization? And please describe the feeling you and your family had when your name was selected in the second round uh, in the from the Bell Center in Montreal. Um, well, going back to the Combine, obviously, this feels like so long ago now, but um, it was only like a month and a half ago. But, you know, that, for, that meeting with the Bruins, I think... Uh, it went well. I think most of my meetings went well at the Combine, but um, kind of just talked about a lot of my meetings were about my skating and what I was looking to do to improve that. Um, that was kind of the, the red flag of my game, and every, every team was kind of bringing it up, but I think kind of went well um, that they, they understood that I was willing to put the time in to try and improve that. Um, obviously, it's never going to be perfect. You can never be as, like, the as good of a skater as you want to be, but it's, there's always room for improvement in every part of my game. So uh, the meeting went well. Um, I think most of all, they kind of liked my, my grit and like my work ethic. You know, what what I don't have in, in skating, I make up for it with just, you know, wanting the puck. I think sometimes I find myself winning more skating races than maybe I should because I just kind of want it more. Um, so I think the meeting went well. The combine went well. So, And then... Fast forward to the draft. Um, the first day was kind of sitting around. I, sh- I went to the first round. I felt like it took forever. I don't know how <laughs> you guys felt watching it, or but it was like the longest night of my life. I thought. Yeah, for, for people that we didn't have a, a first round pick in the first round uh, with the Boston Bruins. Yeah, it was pretty damn long for us too. Yeah, it was like four <laughs> hours. I was kind of sitting in my yeah. chair, knowing I wasn't going to get picked, so that was kind of tough. But. Uh, you know, I was I didn't really sleep the night before the second round, like the second, the seventh round, because super nervous. I didn't know what to expect. And then the next, the next uh, morning, my agent kind of pulled me aside and said, you know, uh, don't feel too stressed out about, or don't worry about like who's getting picked before you, because obviously you're gonna see guys that you know. Um, but don't worry about it. And then got to the draft. I knew it was a possibility I could go to the Bruins. Um, I was really hoping that they would take me with the 54th overall. Uh, it ended up happening. No, nice. thank you. But, yeah, um, just a great day for me and my family. We got to, well, I met them. Well, I had to do all that media stuff, which I'm not too good at usually, but I had to all do, go all do that. And then kind of met my family after, a couple hours after. And obviously they got to sit in the lounge and have a few drinks. And they were super excited. Um, nice. You never really see my dad smile that much. So <laughs> that's pretty nice to see. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, well. If it's if it's anything like that smile that you had, uh, you know, walking down the, the the stands down to the Bruins table, it, it runs in the family. Let me, yeah, let me tell uh, you. I think I smile a bit more than him. He's more even. <laughs> yeah. I I can tell you, Matt. We've had other uh, uh, Bruins draft picks on this show in the past, and they all say the same thing: can't sleep the night before, nervous as hell. So you're you're just part of the group. That's that's all it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> You're not any different from anybody else, but I, I, w- I want to ask you about um, some other OHLers that are part part of the uh, Bruins family now. So, um, and honestly, I, I can't remember the Bruins having four OHL prospects. I, I think 2011 was the last time. Um, so there's yourself, obviously. Uh, Jackson Edward out of London, you played against him uh, last season. I believe you also played against him in your under-16 year. Yeah. Uh, you got to play against Ryan Mast in Sarnia. Uh, unfortunately, with the conference play, you didn't get to play against Brett Harrison last season. But did you know any of them before going to the the – Development camp at all? Uh, yeah, I already knew uh, Eddie because I just played against him since I was, however, like many years <laughs> old. I've uh, been playing against him forever. He's kind of oh, he plays the same way as he did in 
minor midget. He's a two-way hard-nosed defenseman who will punish you. Um, oh, he loves to hit. Yeah, yeah he fought me a couple times <laughs> growing up. So. <laughs> but well, yeah, you'll, have to, you'll have to get him back. Yeah, well, we'll see. He's a big boy. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I already knew him. Um, I got to know Harry pretty well at camp. I'm um, talking to him. Uh, and then Mass, obviously, I played against him this year. He, uh, it's hard to play against big body, hard to take off the puck, especially in the four checks and nightmare because he's so big. As a smaller guy, you know, sometimes it's hard to physically remove him from the puck. So, yeah. Well, that that's going to take me to my next question, but I'll let these two guys go ahead first. No, go ahead, Dom. If you have a good follow-up, go ahead. <clears throat> okay. So, Matt, I want to read something. I wrote back in November, and I don't know if you know, but I do player profiles on on OHL draft eligible players. Um, I wrote this back in November. Uh, one of the things you'll, one of the first things you'll notice about uh, Poitra is his work ethic. He has an internal engine that just will not stop or pause. His "I will not be outworked" mentality is hard to match. He goes into every battle with sheer determination and a will to win. So what's your mentality when you hop over the boards? I think for me, it's just I want the puck. It's always been the, the way I've played, especially the way I've been taught to play. Um, just go back to, uh, I'd say like my, my dad, it was always he would always get on me if he felt like I wasn't going to get the puck. I was waiting for someone else to get it. So for me, it was just I wanted the puck. I want to possess the puck. I want to kind of control the play. That's the way I play. Um, you know, I like to be the guy creating offense. I don't want to be waiting for someone else to feed me a backdoor tap. I don't want to be kind of the guy out there. Um, so I guess work ethic comes with that. If you're not going to be willing to work the other guy, you're not going to have the puck on your stick. So mm-hmm. Good well answer. Said. I like that. Well said. Mm-hmm. I wanted to go back to um, – when we were talking about the draft, um, you had mentioned that you were hoping that the Bruins uh, picked you with that 54th pick. Did you have any inclination that they were going to pick you um, from conversations you may have had with the organization or your agent or anything like that? Mm, not really. Um, I always like kind of think about like the OHL draft compared to the NHL draft, but like the OHL draft, uh, Anybody, like a bunch of guys could have told you all the selections that are going to be made in the first round in order, before, like the night before. But then, like, you get to the NHL draft, and I talk to my agent, and he's like, you could go here, you could go here. Like, he doesn't have, like, he doesn't know, because everything's so tight-lipped um, with, uh, you know, draft lists and stuff like that. So I, I had an idea. I knew they, they liked the way I played, but I had no, no idea until I kind of got picked that I was going to be a brewer. Awesome. Uh, I don't know that you that you never know because I've nailed a couple over over the years that they were going to pick. So, um, uh, but we'll go to Mark here. <laughs> oh, there was, there was a there was a possibility, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, Matt, last month you attended the annual Boston Bruins development development camp. And uh, what did you think of the city and the training facility at Warrior Ice Arena in Boston and your overall experience in the five-day um, uh, duration of camp? Um, it was a tough week. Uh, you know, showing up on the, the Sunday we had dinner, then Monday it was like 5 a.m. wake up and you're doing a bike test at 7 o'clock. So that was kind of an eye-opener for me. Probably the hardest fitness test I've ever done. Um, I don't know, after I was done, I just laid on the ground, and I didn't move for 20 minutes. <laughs> so, but overall, like the city of Boston, we got to, the Warrior, like, training center was, like, nothing I've ever seen before. Was, I couldn't compare it to anything, because, like, a thousand times, well, not that much better, but, like, way better than anything I've ever, like, been to. It's, like, it's just, I don't know how to explain it. It's just, it's like, showtime, I guess, <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah, right, yeah. next level. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, anyways. Um, the week was good. It was a grueling week, but I thought I had, uh, I thought I performed pretty well in the testing and on the ice, so um, it was good to kind of get my foot in the door, uh, kind of meet everybody and 
now I know kind of what to expect for going into main camp. It's going to be more difficult, but I know the testing that I need to do, and hopefully I can do better on it this time around. And um, other than that, we got to do some rowing on I can't remember what the river's called. Charles. Charles River, I guess yep. it's famous for rowing. Um, oh, yeah. I've never done that before, but that was pretty fun. We got to do a tour of the garden, which is just sick. It was so sick. Even though there was no ice in it, but it was super cool. I got to see the dressing room, um, all that. And then what else did we do? We did a top golf. You know, there's lots of, lots of little things we did throughout the week. So it was, overall, it's just a good experience. That's, awesome. uh, and, and to follow up on that, if you happen to be a scout in the, uh, in the stands during development camp, which players really excited you to watch? I thought, um, for me, it was kind of the, the guys who really stood out were, uh, you know, the guys who played in the A last year or played in the show. Um, McLaughlin really stood out. He sat beside me in the room. It was just the way he kind of prepared himself for everything. Um, Everything he did was with a purpose, whether it be like a, like a battle drill to start a practice or like a simple 2 on 0 drill. He just kind of did everything with a purpose, and so he's the first guy in the gym before practice rolling out or using the Theragun, like stuff like that. It just kind of stood out to me and showed me what I should try and do to keep my body prepared throughout you know, the entire season so, so I can perform my best at all times. So, And like the way he kind of acted like a pro through the week kind of really stood out to me. Mm-hmm. Nice. So uh, just out of our curiosity, Matt, with the, with the uh, development camp, camp, they went through things like nutrition with you and, and all that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, on, I know in past year, the years they brought in uh, their chef, I can't remember his name, uh, to talk to the to the prospects about uh, good nutrition and how to prepare food. Did that happen this season? Yeah, we did. They went over things like how to separate like the egg from the, the egg white, like little <laughs> things like that. Um, we had our like lunch and breakfast there every day. It was yeah, delicious. The best food I've ever eaten, really. Um, so that was good. And then, we yeah, we went over how to prepare things. Like I think he made a turkey burger. Um, but yeah, I'm not much of a cook. I think I need to go over a few things with my mom to kind of prepare. Well, that's Maybe. what the families are for, man. Well, yeah, yeah but, you know, eventually eventually, I'm going to have to provide for myself. So, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I don't know, a big thing for me, maybe next summer, I'm going to try and learn how to cook a bit more because right now I can make frozen pizzas. And chicken <laughs> <laughs> that's not good for a hockey player, buddy. Not good I can only life. make the things with the instructions on the box. So. <laughs> you know, Matt, you're not alone. I'm still there. <laughs> Trying to learn how to cook at 31 years yeah. old. I, want to I hope you get it way before I do. I hope you do. Yeah, well, I, I know how to cook eggs now, so they crush them eggs in the morning. That's all I really need. Oh, funny. Yeah. Just to follow up to that, Matt, have the Bruins talked to you, or do you know? Are you going to the Prospects Challenge in Buffalo? Yeah, I am. You nice. are okay. Mm-hmm. So I think it's. Oh, I go to Guelph the 28th of August. We'll do, I guess I'll be there for a bit of camp, and then I think maybe a couple preseason games. And then off to Boston, I think, either the 13th or the 12th. Um, There's some testing, and then the prospect tournament starts the 16th, I think, or the 15th. So, yeah, Yeah. I'll be there. Okay. They're going to try and make it uh, down to Buffalo this year. Mm -hmm. Um, Going... Back, going back to before you, you know, really started your hockey career. Um, who were your hockey idols growing up, and do you model your game with them in mind at all? Um, for me, uh, it was Jonathan Tays. I've got a big jersey over there in a the frame, Jonathan Tays jersey. Um, he was always my favorite player growing up because I, I love the Hawks, and he was kind of, you know, the captain and the big. One of the big point producers, so he was always my favorite. Whenever I got to see him play, you know, I went to a Leafs game when I was really young, and that was like one of the coolest things because I got to watch my favorite team. Oh, they played the Hawks. I forgot to add that, but I got to watch my favorite team play against the Leafs. So that's one of my cooler experiences. Um, no, I just liked I like the number nineteen. I think um, 
like the way he kind of was a, was the captain. So the captain of the team. But now, like growing up, kind of watching the way he plays, one hundred and ten percent at all times. He's he's like the definition of a leader. He's one of the best. I'd say one of the better captains, maybe ever. But um, yeah, I just, he's As, just aside from Patrice Bergeron, of course, <laughs> right, Matt? Yeah. Yes, yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky for you, number nineteen is currently open. Uh, in the for the Boston Bruins, so that's good mm-hmm. for you there. Worn by such greats as uh, Joe Thornton and Tyler Sagan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that was Sagan the most recent one? Yes. Uh, no. no. Senishin. Yeah, oh. Exact Senishin. Got it. That's right. Yep. Um, Matt, uh, talking about your your career and moving forward, and we know that you're a signer with Guelph right now, um, but. With the Boston Bruins organization, and particularly the center position, um, they tend to want to like uh, get versatility into games. Do, would you have any problem? And I know you wouldn't have any problem because you're probably in an NHL game. But would you have any issues with uh, going to the right side to 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 go there? Because I know it from listening to so many scouts, and and obviously Dom Tiano mentions this so many times to me that it's easier for a center to go to a wing than a wing going to a center. What are your thoughts on that? And, and if you were to play on the right side, would it be a comfortable position? Uh, yeah. Um, in Guelph this year, it was, I was kind of all over the place. The lineup was all over the place. So I got, a, especially near the end of the season in playoffs, I played a lot of wing, a lot of right wing um, with Passage of and Zilkin. So I don't know like, where I'm going to start next year. But, yeah, playing the wing uh, took a couple games to get used to because really the first time I've ever played wing in my life other than, the U18 Team Canada camp uh, last summer. That was my first time playing wing in my life. Um, but, you know, it wasn't it wasn't too bad of a transition. I think I'd say it's a bit more of a simpler game. I don't know. Maybe some wingers would say different. But um, for me, it was more of a, a simple game because, you know, being in position defensive zones, I'd, I'd say it's a bit easier. You have a bit less responsibility. And um, sometimes it's a bit easier to create offense when you don't have to worry as much about playing defense still a big responsibility blocking shots and kind of keeping track of your d-man but for me i thought it was a simpler game a little bit less skating i found myself with a more energy kind of in the offensive area of the ice so i i'm pretty comfortable switching the right wing uh, i can play anywhere on the ice i'd say Excellent. No, probably not defense, but <laughs> I, I got a I got a follow up question real quick. Um, so you'd say that um, would you say that center though is where you feel most comfortable? And if you and you know I'm not gonna say if when you make it to the NHL, is that a position where you would like to see yourself in? Is at the center position? Obviously, I'd love to play center. I've played center my whole life, but um, you know, as a smaller guy, I might be. And I didn't have too good of a year on draws. Hopefully it's better next year. And obviously draws are a huge part of the game and having possession. I, you know, I'm, I would love to play center, but if I need to play wing, I can do whatever. So, yeah. Matt, don't worry about your face-offs because I can tell you, and I've been keeping track of the stats since probably 2005, uh, there hasn't been a draft eligible. There have been... I could probably count on two hands the number of draft eligible players that have gone in the into the OHL and won fifty percent of their draws their first year. So mm-hmm. don't worry about that, my friend. It'll come. It got better it, near the end of the year, but it's yeah, the it, it was just a, a grown man like experienced thing. I was facing off against big guys who were just overpowering me sometimes. So. Yeah, it, 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 it takes time. It doesn't it doesn't come overnight. And who knows? Um, maybe by the time you get to the NHL, Patrice Bergeron will be uh, an assistant coach with the Bruins and he'll give you some tips on, yeah. on what he draws. I would love some tips. <laughs> but speak, speaking of Bergeron, I, I don't know how much you followed the Bruins since they were eliminated from the – from the playoffs against Carolina, but um, you know they they went center heavy on the draft uh, this year. Um, even signed uh, some college free agents to, that can play down the middle because, in all honesty, it's a weakness for them in the future. 
Uh, what kind of confidence does that give you knowing that, and I can tell you the Bruins see you as a center, not as a winger, that they, sh how, that they showed that much confidence in you. Um, uh, what does that mean to you? Um, well, I try not to think too much about the future. You know, I'm kind of living the present type of guy. Um, <laughs> but I kind of worry about now, then everything in the future will kind of play itself out. Um, you know, but seeing maybe the middle of the ice being a bit open, obviously it creates a little bit of excitement, but I can tell you there's probably a bunch of other guys that see it the same way and that I need to out-compete and kind of win those those spots for. So it's, if nothing's a given, um, obviously it creates a little bit of excitement, but I've got a lot of work to do in the next two or three years to kind of mature into the player I want to be. So, Well, you kind of answered my last question for you, but I'm going to ask it after anyway. Mark, go ahead. Well, that's, I, I don't have any more for the... For the Kevin? Um, yeah, I, I think I definitely, yeah, actually, this is perfect. Um, I know you just said that you don't like to uh, look too far into the future, which that was a great answer, by the way, a very professional answer. But is there any players in specific that you would like to play with on the Bruins roster? Uh, nothing specific. Obviously, playing with, like, a, maybe a goal scorer like Pasternak would be crazy. You know, guarantees a lot of, a lot of assists. <laughs> Um, cause kind of the kind of things he can do on the ice and put the puck in the back of that, which is what he does best. Um, but no, like no one's super specific. Just I'll play with anyone. Just want to play in the NHL like every kid. Awesome. <laughs> um, okay. I wanted to turn your attention to this upcoming season in Guelph and we touched on it a, bu a bit earlier. Um, you know, a very, very young team, um, uh, Got off to a fantastic start. I'm expecting big things from not only yourself, your teammates in Guelph, and uh, I could see a division championship and going deep into the playoffs uh, for you. Uh, and I know that you said you don't look too far into the future, but do you have any goals uh, for your team or more specifically for yourself for this upcoming season? Um, you know, thinking team wise, I know a lot of the younger guys from last year. Like we're, like I'm so excited to get back to Guelph. Um, we're all super excited to get back together. You know, kind of missing those guys. I haven't really seen them much over the summer, but I think there's high expectations in the organization. Um, I believe that we can make a run at a championship this year. Um, I think we have the right pieces. Um, we've all got a year under our belt now. Uh, and we've got, I think, maybe two forwards gone from last year, and then a couple D, three or four D, which um, we got Butcher and Allen back on the back end, and Profaka, I think. So, you know, I, ex I expect us to make a deep run. Um, anything less, would, I think, would be kind of a disappointment because I know we have a really good group of guys. Um, everybody gets along, and I wouldn't say... I'd say that's pretty rare for... A, entire group to get as long as as well as we do so, yeah. I mean, just we want to try and win a championship this year for me personally i try not to think about too much about like points and stuff like that but it would be great for me to have like an 80 plus point season as a kind of second guy second year guy in the league i expect to produce a lot more than i did last year um maybe take on a bit of a leadership role but um that's kind of what i expect for myself going into next season so that, that was going to be my next question, actually, was um, do you see yourself taking over any type of leadership? Maybe not a patch, you know, maybe not a letter, but, you know, just the atmosphere of it and doing that. Because I know that you were a captain before getting into juniors, correct? Yeah, I was in my minor match team. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, you know, we've got a lot of great leaders in our room, um, whether it be like an 05, like Alan or an older guy like Profaka. We got a lot of a lot of guys who could wear a letter. Um, I, if I'm not wearing a letter this year, it's not not a big deal. Um, I'm still gonna try and take on a leadership role, kind of try and show the young guys um, my support. Maybe try and guide them a bit. I know when I showed up to camp last year, I was super nervous, didn't know too many of the guys, and 
there's a few guys that kind of guided me and made me feel like I was at home. So I'm going to try and be that guy for the 06 is coming in um, try and help them out a bit. So. Uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned Alan. Did you, did you get a chance to watch any of the Holinka Gretzky at all, Matt? No, I did watch a bit. Not yeah, you not, must have been really happy for him. Eh? Yes, super happy. He's a great guy. Obviously, phenomenal hockey player. He's he's so good. Um, you know, playing with him last year is kind of like I don't know how is this guy in '05. Um, he's, yeah, he played like he was 20 years old. Um, you watch him you wouldn't you wouldn't think he was a rookie um you know he's a yeah, so good rookie of the year no captain of the u18 he's yeah good guy yeah, that's amazing yeah. for him to do amazing but you know uh just how you smiled when i asked you uh i know that's a sign of a good leader so you know you keep that up <laughs> absolutely yeah all right, Matt, I think we're going to wrap it up with you. And I just want to uh, truly, truly uh, tell you that we really appreciate the time today. And uh, I really look forward to watching you and the Gulf Storm next season. Bruins fans, seriously, the CHL live package is not that expensive. We're going to have a lot of prospects up in the, uh, in the O, uh, you know, working and developing and, 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 you know, getting their way, paving their way to the NHL. And I would highly suggest you get that package and follow Matt. Because uh, he's a tremendous player, and I'm looking forward to it. I haven't seen a lot of games, Matt. I've always seen his videotape, but now videotape. I, I'm showing my age now. Uh, yeah. But like Twitter, you know, um, uh, YouTube yeah. and so on. Yeah. But now I'm I'm going to be starting to pay a lot more attention to uh, the Gulf Storm. So yeah. uh, continue, lock my friend, and thank you so much for joining the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. And I will be at the Sleeman Center several times throughout the season. Just oh, yeah. one quick thing, if I can, Matt. Yeah. So uh, every every year or so when the Bruins have a prospect in the OHL, I like to give away a jersey when they sign their entry-level contract. Uh, I just come up with a contest for them, end up getting thousands of, uh, of uh, literally thousands of people trying to win. So if Lindsay ever approaches you and says, Don needs this jersey signed, just make sure you sign it, okay? Oh, I will. I will, I will okay. sign it. Yeah. Awesome. All right, that is Matthew Poitois, and he is a Boston Bruins prospect selected in the 2022 NHL draft off to Guelph to play for his storm. Matthew, thanks again, and uh, uh, best wishes to you and your family for the upcoming year. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again for tuning in and supporting this week's episode of the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast. Please give the show a five-star rating and write a review on listening platforms such as Apple Podcasts and Spotify Podcasts. If you'd like to contact the show for advertising opportunities or to send us a question or topic idea we should be discussing, please send us an email to blackandgoldproductionsllc at gmail.com. Don't forget to share our program on your social media platforms with other hockey fans and follow our Twitter accounts at Black and Gold Pod, at BNG Productions, at Black and Gold 277, and at Kevin underscore O'Keefe 89. Also, please don't forget to check out our official blackandgoldhockey.com website where we cover the Bruins organization from the NHL level down to the prospects worldwide. Peace out.